Good morning, good afternoon, everybody. Let me start my part. So for the Atmos RT crossover MCU family introduction and some update for the latest product announced and released. So then I will uh, head over to Clark for the MCU Espresso. So this is uh, Alan Lee. I'm the NSP Atmos RT product marketing manager. Um, so today I will take about 15 minutes to give you an overview and some key features on the Atomas RT, especially on RT1010, this new released low cost, high performance crossover MCU. So I believe you know Atomas RT family is the, the new kind of new family. We just launched the first RT part in 2017, October. So it's only two years for this family. But uh, we want to use this crossover MCU family, Atomos RT, uh, to um, leverage the best of the both MCU world and also the application processors world. That means RT has the ease of use from MCU because it is M7 core, and also RT is providing the high performance, the highest performance MCUs on the world, up to gigahertz MCU. Um, and you know that we have uh, many uh, first uh, from the RT family, right? So 2017 is the first RT, uh, it's RT 1050. This part is also the first crossover MCU can reach to 600 megahertz. That was a record breakthrough um, uh, speed of performance for the MCU. And then uh, in 2018, we have another new RT is RT600. This is the first 28 nanometer FDSOI crossover MCU. Uh, it's M33 core and with high fi 4 DSP. Right? And then this year, in um, two weeks ago, we announced another first. It is RT 1170. This is the first uh, uh, gigahertz MCU and it has dual core M7 and M4. So M7 can run up to gigahertz and M4 can run up to 400 megahertz. And also um, we do have some other RT families like RT 1060, 1064, and 1020, 1015, 1010. All these part we launched uh, in the past two years. And we do have some RT based solution, right? You can see the orange box here. Uh, we list some of the solutions based on the RT1060, right? The one for the Alexa voice solution, and one for facial recognition solution, and one for the local far field voice control solution. That all um, thanks to the high performance of the RT family. So with this uh, high performance core M7 and also uh, we build a lot of features on this Atomos RT crossover MCUs. Right? Uh, so this family is an uh, ideal solution targeting to many applications, including the voice, audio, consumer, and home and building automation, industrial and motor control, and power commercial sector. And this page shows the roadmap of the Atomos RT family, right? You see the first part is Atomos RT 1050 in 2017. And based on this successful uh, platform, we build uh, two paths within the RT family. So one path is a low cost one, right? Uh, we have the RT 1020, which we uh, halved as SRAM. And then we have the RT 1015, 1010 with some feature uh, reduction and uh, optimization to make these low cost RT families. All these families are uh, with the LKLP package. We can provide uh, even lower cost, bomb cost or PCB cost. And then another part of Atomos RT family is that we're moving upside with uh, higher performance, more features, more memories, more integrations. On this path, we have the RMX RT 1060, uh, which we doubled the SRAM size, uh, 
on RT 1050. So it's one megabyte as well on RT 1060. And then we have another one in RT 1064, which we add the four megabyte flash uh, in the package. And RT 1170 is a superset one till now in the RT family. It has the, the highest performance M7 core can run up to gigahertz. And also it has the second core M4. And also um, on RT 1170, we, uh, we bring in some very interesting new features like the um, gigabit Ethernet with AVB and uh, um, TSM. And also we bring in the uh, MIPI, DSI, and T uh, CSI interface. And also we uh, qualify this part uh, for automotive applications as well. So uh, we do have another part at RT600. We announced this part um, early this year. And this is a M33 core with a, a very high speed 600 megahertz RFI4 DSP. So this is another dual core device in RT family. Uh, this device RT600 is a very uh, um, capable uh, chip for the audio or voice uh, kind of uh, applications. Right. Let's see what we have on the RT uh, family. This is a, a master or superset uh, block diagram for RT 10XX family. Uh, so we can see that we have M7 core uh, and also we have the multimedia uh, features like the parallel uh, camera interface and LCD interface. Uh, and also we have the 2D accelerator, um, which we call PXP, the pixel processing pipeline. Um, can also help offload the CPU with this hardware accelerator uh, block. And also on RT, we have uh, uh, many uh, external memory interfaces. Right? So RT is a uh, flashless uh, family. Uh, so we do have the external um, flash expansion interface like the, the parallel uh, external memory interface. Uh, and also we do have the quad spy or octo spy interface for the flash and also um, we have the SD RAM interface um, so customer can uh, have a more memory uh, flexibility to extend on the RT platform and also uh, we have a bunch of uh, connectivity features like the SD IO or EMFC uh, interface and uh, UART SPC SPI Ethernet, high speed USB with Spy and CAN and CAN FD. Um, also, Ethernet, uh, we have two Ethernet on the, some of the part with the uh, IEEE 15.88 support. And then we have the analog features like ADC and uh, analog comparators. Um, also, we have uh, the security features like uh, ciphers and uh, we have the RNG and the secure RTC sector. Um, so on RT, we also built the, the on-chip DC-DC, which can further uh, uh, lower the customer's uh, bomb cost. So you only uh, need to uh, supply one 3.3 volt DC to the RT chip. And then we have the on-chip DC-DC and LDO to provide the uh, many uh, different uh, levels of the power to the core, to the peripheral sector. So I know today we are going to uh, talk more about the RT1010. This is, uh, uh, we just announced, uh, sorry, we just launched this part uh, two weeks ago. And this is a very uh, um, cost efficient part, right? Um, so this is a 500 megahertz, megahertz M7. And it has 128k byte uh, uh, SRAM, can be configured to TCM or, or, or uh, the on chip SRAM. And uh, we do have the external um, the, the quad spy or uh, octo spy interface for the external uh, flash or um, hyper RAM. And we provided on the flight eruption engine with this uh, uh, Q spy uh, interface. So the customer can program the interrupted image to the external QSPY flash or octo flash. And then this uh, engine, autofight extracting engine, will uh, decrypt the interrupted image on the fly. 
And on this chip, we also have some other features like USB, I square S, um, and uh, security features. And the package for this uh, RT1010 device is ADLKLP package. I do have some other slides to go a uh, little more detail on these key features on the RT1010. So the first one is a PMU. And I said just now that we have the on-chip DCDC and LDO um, for uh, providing uh, the different voltage for the core, for the peripheral, uh, et cetera. So you only need to uh, provide one single 3.3 volt power supply to this chip. And we have, we have uh, several LDOs on, on, the, on the chip. And we do have the app nodes that you can leverage and you can have more details to, uh, to know how to use the LMS RT low power features and get the lowest power you want and uh, switch uh, between the different uh, low power and run uh, uh, mode. So the second uh, feature here I want to highlight is the flex RAM. So, on RT1010, we have 128K byte SRAM, which can be shared with ITCM, DTCM, or the general purpose uh, on chip RAM. And we have the three uh, uh, integrated RAM controller uh, to control all these three types of the memories. We also have another AN uh, for how to use a flex RAM on RT. So uh, the third one is a flex SPI, right? This is a flexible feature uh, that can uh, allow a customer to connect to um, many, many uh, types of the memories uh, through the SPI or quad or octo interface. So this uh, flex SPI can support uh, uh, one data line, two data line, four data line, or eight data line uh, uh, zero interfaces. And we have some uh, connect uh, mode that you can connect up to uh, four flash uh, through this flex SPI because we have the dual channel called SPI on um, this IP. So you have two channels of the quad SPI and uh, on each of the quad SPI channel, you have two uh, CS. So you can totally, uh, you can have a uh, four uh, flash connected to this device. And also you can uh, combine the two quad channel to an uh, octo channel that by this way you can connect to the octo uh, interface flash or, or um, SRAM, hyper SRAM. So uh, this is another very interesting uh, feature called flex IO. Um, flex means flexible again. So this uh, flex IO IP uh, is very, uh, uh, useful for the customers, right? It can uh, be configured to any standard uh, uh, zero interface like UART, I square C, SPI, or I square S. And also, it can configure to any um, customized uh, zero interface. Uh, we have the register, we have uh, the configurations the customer can use uh, to configure to whatever you want for the zero interface. And also, we do have a uh, on uh, RT1010, we have up to 27 pins can be assigned to this flex IO. So uh, it can also connect to the, some parallel interface like the camera or the, the can also can generate some um, uh, PWM or waveform. We have several examples in our SDK. Um, so you can download the SDK and try the, those examples with uh, flex IO. Uh, flex PWM. Um, so this is uh, the another key feature on the RT1010, right? Uh, I do see some customers use this IP for the motor control and uh, switch mode power supply uh, with this IP. So it is a 16-bit resolution uh, uh, PWM, and uh, you can get some more details from the, our recent manual or data sheet, and we do have a uh, Notes that to show a demo built 
based on RT1010, this device with the LCD display and the PMSM mode control. So ISWS SAI is a key feature for the audio or voice uh, applications. Uh, we have uh, the two S uh, two I S module on the RT ten ten, which you can use uh, to connect to the uh, audio devices like microphone or speakers or uh, audio codec. So with the launch uh, on the October tenth, which is two weeks ago. RT1010, we do bring the EVK evaluation kit with this launch. So on this EVK, we have the uh, crossby flash, we have the audio codec and the headphone jack um, and an external speak connection, which we use these uh, connectors to build our demos. Right? And uh, uh, we do have the software support ready SDK download. And also uh, we have some user guide for this EVK and we do release the design files. Uh, that means that the PCB layout, Gerber file, and the schematics on the web, you can download it freely. And also we have a very special um, promotional price for the RT1010 EVK. It's just another 1010, it's $10.10, but it's only through December this year. So if you want one special price, RT1010 EVK, Order now. Um, and then I will uh, head over to uh, Clark, our MC with Preso Product Manager for the uh, second part of this today's uh, webinar. All right, Alan, thank you very much. All right. So good morning, good afternoon, everybody. Uh, this is Clark. I'm going to cover the actual software um, and kind of a, a development experience in using the, this RT1010 board. I wanted to uh, first cover uh, some of the MC Expresso pieces, right? So as part of the enablement for the i.mx RT1010, we offer the full MC Expresso software and tools support. Uh, the MC Expresso software and tools is made up of three primary components. There is the MC Expresso IDE. This is the, uh, the main uh, compiler um, code editor that we'll be using. We'll see that in the actual kind of hands-on portion of this presentation. There's the MCU Expresso SDK. This is the runtime software, the drivers and peripherals and middleware that we will be developing the code with. And then there's also the configuration tools that we'll be using to configure the pin muxing as well as to initialize some of the peripherals. So we'll see each of those three pieces in action as we go throughout the actual uh, live portion of the demo. A little bit more about the MCU Expresso IDE itself. It is a free Eclipse-based IDE. It's a feature-rich IDE. Um, foundationally, it is built upon Eclipse and under the hood is the ARM GCC compiler as well as the ARM GDB for debug capabilities and supports a variety of different enabling tool technologies such as debug probes from Seger and p &E, as well as the CMSYS DAP debug technology that comes pre-programmed on the board itself. So this will be the main tool that you use for actually doing the compiling and uh, editing of the code, the application development. What you're developing is based on the MC Expresso SDK. These are the software framework and the drivers. So foundationally built upon the CMSYS core, CMSYS DSP libraries and source files, NXP provides a variety of peripheral drivers. So for every peripheral driver, a lot of those that Alan mentioned earlier in his presentation, we have peripheral drivers for those in the SDK that allow you to develop your application on. In addition to the peripheral drivers, we also include uh, RTOS integration, the, the premier uh, RTOS that is included or integrated into the SDK itself is the Amazon free RTOS, um, but there are also ways to incorporate other RTOSs or just to use it as bare metal. In addition to uh, some of the traditional peripheral drivers specifically for Amazon free RTOS, there are a number of free RTOS specific drivers as well that allow a little tighter integration with free RTOS and take advantage of some of the interrupts and in, in workings of free RTOS. 
There are also a variety of integrated stacks and middlewares that are included, including a USB host or USB stack that supports host device and on the go. Things like lightweight IP for a networking stack, file systems such as FATFS and LittleFS, as well as a variety of others, and tons of examples. Uh, we won't get in too much into the examples in this particular demo, but a lot of the getting started guides that exist on the nxp.com page, that we will point out, uh, do you walk you through some of using some of those examples. The third piece of the MC Expresso suite of tools is the configuration tools. The version of the configuration tools that we'll be using for this live demonstration is actually integrated directly into the MC Expresso IDE. So we'll be using effectively a, a, an Eclipse perspective that lets us do all of this con code configuration. Uh, but there are standalone versions of the configuration tools that can be downloaded and run independent from the IDE, particularly if you're using other IDEs like IR's Embedded Workbench or Kyle's MDK. But the main purpose of the configuration tools is to do things like pin muxing, clock configuration, and peripheral initialization. And it'll generate the code, handle the various error checking, um, and make sure that you can uh, kind of get your project up and running as quickly as possible. And we'll see running through both pin configuration and peripheral initialization in this, uh, this live demo. Uh, some of the other features that are supported for the RT specifically are the DCD, the device configuration that actually lets you do some of the pre-initialization of the device at boot time so that you can uh, actually program the device in a, a variety of ways uh, to be able to support those, those programming flows. So why kind of we do this? What is the purpose of these MC Expresso software and tools? What we really are trying to accomplish is to make sure that you guys have an efficient development flow. You have a way to, to start with the, the base software that you need. There is an online SDK builder that lets you go in and customize the SDK, the software package, that is specific for your device. Go in and select the device, add the particular middleware that is of interest to you, and we will handcraft an SDK for you to download. Once that's downloaded, it's a simple drag and drop operation into the IDE. Uh, to install that and that creates awareness in the IDE, IDE of this device uh, so that you can then start working with the examples, create new projects, or uh, start developing on it. So at this point we've got the SDK installed, we're working inside of the IDE and we're using the examples, uh, the demo apps, and working with the evaluation board, the EDK, that NXP provides for the RT1010 or any other device provided by NXP. So you're going through there, creating proof of concepts, doing some initial development. But at the end of the day, you eventually need to move on to your hardware itself. And so that's where the configuration tools really come into play and in providing a mechanisms there for you to develop code on an evaluation board and then to be able to port that over to your hardware as well without having uh, a lot of rewriting of the code um, if done correctly, or if there are design changes in your hardware itself, quick fix to the configuration tool to reassign the pins or the, the clock structure, generate the code and you're back up and running. So again, that's, that's the, the flow that we're trying to create with these tools. There are similar workflows. They are slightly different um, for if you're using uh, other tool chains like IR, uh, Kyle or GCC. Uh, in those cases, you'd be using the standalone configuration tools, uh, but the concepts are generally the same. If you do want to get more information about the MC Expresso software and tools, uh, there's a variety of web pages on nxp.com, um, both for kind of the tools as a whole, as well as the individual tools, the SDK, the IDE, and the config tools. There's also an MC Expresso SDK builder. This is where you would go to actually download and configure an SDK. Uh, I'll show you kind of a quick shortcut into that tool um, from the actual board page that exists for the RT1010. There also are a number of communities, again, both for the high level MCU Expresso as well as individual communities for the SDK, IDE, and config tools. This is an excellent resource to go uh, to learn more information, to be able to ask questions and to be able to get answers and to help those in that community as well. Okay, so with that, we're actually going to jump right into the lab itself, and I'll kind of walk through this. Uh, the way I'll do it is I will throw up a slide uh, here that kind of talks, uh, 
generally about the, the basic steps that we'll be using. Um, and then I'll switch over to the particular tool, or in this case, a web page, uh, to actually do that piece of it live to kind of show, um, show it in action. Um, if you have in the chat window, there was a post uh, that linked to this presentation. Uh, if you do want to download the presentation, you can use it as kind of a refresher um, as you're going back through and following these same steps, or you can use it to follow along in this webinar as well. So the first place that we're going to start with is the actual nxp.com page for the RT, the i.mx RT1010 EDK. So you see the link here at the top. Um, I've already got it up. And on this page is where we're going to see uh, the, the various information about the board. And what I wanted to highlight is this getting started tab right here. So the button here will take us off this page and onto a getting started guide. Um, on this guide, there are videos that tell us how to run kind of the out of the box for the video or for the board itself. And it'll walk us through using the tools um, and actually importing a variety of different SDK examples to really kind of get the board up and running. Now, we're not going to follow this guide as part of this webinar. We're going to take a slightly different approach, but I did want to point this out and to encourage each of you to go through and run through this getting started guide as well. What I did want to point out is the step number two in getting software. I'm gonna click on this and that's gonna switch me over to another page where I can choose what I want to develop with. And we're gonna choose this development path with the NXP uh, MCU Expresso SDK. There are other options for using Zephyr OS if that is your choice. So select the, the NXP development SDK and you'll see down here we have a couple of options that are going to allow us to download the necessary SDK and tools that we are going to use. What's nice about this link here where the get into Expresso SDK is this will take us right into the SDK builder, right? this online repository for us to be able to download our SDK, but it'll already be set up and configured ready for us to be able to download the SDK for the RT1010. So I'll click on it. It should take me back over to the SDK Builder page with all of the necessary pieces selected for me. So I'm actually ready to download the SDK straight away. Um, if you do choose, um, there are other software components that we can add into the device. This is where I could add Amazon Free RTOS um, if I wanted to add MCU Boot, uh, different graphics packages, or include the CMSYS DSP libraries. I can do that here. For the purposes of this demo, we're just gonna leave it with the default settings and I could click download SDK. Now it's a pretty small download. I think uh, it says 18 megabytes. Uh, I'm not gonna go ahead and download this time. I already have it downloaded. So let me just go ahead and cancel this. But what would happen is you would download the SDK as a zip archive. There are also some other downloads if you want to download the documentation separately or view some other information. You can do that from this page. I'm gonna go ahead and close this, and we're gonna to switch to the IDE itself. So this is the MCU Expresso IDE. This is typically what it would look like after just opening it up. I think there actually is a, a welcome page uh, the first time you open it, um, but I've already closed that. And then there's a panel here that specifies if I would like to, or what SDKs I have installed. You'll see I have a number of SDKs that are already installed on my machine. Uh, but here I have my download. This is where I downloaded the uh, SDK for the i.mx RT1010. I can take this zip file and just drag it into this panel. And it'll ask me to confirm that installation. And it's a pretty quick process. It does keep this SDK as a zip file and just kind of stores it away. Uh, but this allows me to now uh, be able to create new projects to import examples. As part of this lab, what we're gonna do, and let me switch back to presentation just to show you these steps. So we've downloaded our SDK. Uh, we've gone through this step. We've actually downloaded it, right? We've clicked on our download button, downloaded the zip file, and then it's a simple drag and drop into the IDE. So the next step we're gonna do is actually create a new project. So there is a quick start panel inside of the IDE. We'll click on new project and it'll open up a dialog box where we can select the board. Uh, depending on the number of SDKs that you have installed, it'll list out the, the various options you have to create a new project and then go through the 
project settings to create a, a blank project. So let me switch back over to the IDE and complete those steps. So here in the quick start panel in the lower left, I have the new project option. So we'll click that. You'll see I do have, again, a variety of SDKs that are already installed. Let's scroll down here and we'll select the 1010 list. And by selecting it here, that basically uh, filters out the list over here on the right side. And I'll click the image here. And once that selection is made, then I can go on to the next step where I can actually then configure my project. Now, for this project, it'll have a variety of default options. Uh, to make our lives a little bit simpler right now, um, I'm going to add a timer peripheral. So this is adding in the periodic, periodic interrupt timer, the PIP driver. So this will actually pull in that additional code into my project itself. Now, if you didn't do this during the process of setting up a new project, not to worry, there's a variety of other ways to add to, to effectively relaunch this dialog box here to add in the additional components. But for now, we're going to, we added our, our PIT, our per periodic interrupt timer, and we're going to hit next to then go into the advanced project, project settings. I'm not gonna change anything here, just wanted to highlight that those, these settings do exist. Um, one of the unique things about the IDAD MX RT series is that they are flashless devices. And you can see a bit of a reflection here, right? The flash here in our memory settings, our memory configuration is highlighting that it is board flash. Um, so this is an external memory. There's a specific driver that'll actually inform the IDE how to go in and program that. Uh, for RAM on this device, we're actually using the onboard, the tightly coupled data memory for the RAM space. So again, not going to make any changes. We're just going to go ahead and hit finish to go to the next step. So we have uh, effectively a shell, a blank project. It's, it's actually a kind of a hello world. In fact, if we, uh, once we see the, the uh, main source file, that's uh, effectively what it does. It goes in, it will configure whatever the default pins are, the default clock settings, and the default peripherals. And then it prints hello world, and then just goes into a while one loop. And so that is the application that we have as kind of this blank project. So switching back over to follow along with the presentation, right, we have created a new project. And the next thing that we're going to do is we want to set up a pin. Now we are going to do a blinky LED, right? Because the, the idea is if you can blink an LED, you can do anything. Now I know that that's not true, uh, but it certainly does um, captured a lot of the basic flows and the, the interactions between the tools that, that do exist, regardless of we're blinking an LED or creating a very complicated application. So hopefully this is, can be used as kind of a, a training um, or a, an information session to really show how these tools work together. And then you can extend those to other peripherals and other pieces of middleware. So what we're gonna do is first, we're going to use the Project Explorer to open up our pen tool. Uh, we will then specify the pin that we want to use. And in this case, we're actually configuring the pin that on our board is connected to an LED. We'll set that up to be an output and then we'll switch over to the peripheral tool. So there's a little option here to select switch tools or switch perspectives, I should say. Um, and from this new peripheral tool perspective, we will configure our periodic interrupt timer. Effectively, what we're going to do is we're programming a, a timer to, to fire off to, to effectively create a, uh, an interrupt or execute an interrupt. Um, and this will set it up to do it every 250 milliseconds, an interrupt will fire. And as part of that interrupt routine, we will then toggle the LED and we'll effectively create a blinky LED. Okay, so let's switch over to our IDE and we'll do that. So there are a variety of ways to open up the configuration tools. And if you're familiar with Eclipse, you know that oftentimes working with multiple projects, which is a feature of Eclipse, you can get yourself in a little bit of trouble in terms of which project is open, which project is active. So I would recommend when launching the configuration tools to select the project that you are working with. And then you can either right click and you'll notice there's an MCU Expresso dialog box here or from the drop down right here in the configuration tools, we can select open pins. So we're gonna start with the pin tool and this will switch perspectives. Again, it's all integrated into the IDE. It's not a separate tool, but it is switching perspectives inside of the IDE that'll have the various features for doing pin configuration. 
Now, lucky for us, the pin that we actually want to use is pin number one. So we don't have to search for it or anything. It's right here at the top. There is a variety of different filtering options if we need, uh, but we can real quickly select the configuration that we want. So it's pin number one. And the way this works is you have the rows specifying the different pins, and then you have the columns specifying the muxing mode that you would like to configure the pin as. Uh, we're gonna configure this as a GPIO. We want to drive the LED. So we can click right here on the cross section of pin one and the GPIO column. Now you'll notice that there is a little ellipse. This does mean that there is some additional selection that we have to make. Uh, so it pops up a little dialogue. Turns out for this pin, there are actually two different GPIO controllers that can be routed to this particular pin. We're just gonna stick with the GPIO one. So we'll put a little check mark there and we can hit done. And you'll notice that pin has been added to our routed pin table. So this is a collection here of all of the pins that we have configured for this particular functional group. Uh, the things that we need to specify now is we want to have it uh, give it an identifier, something a little more useful for us than GPIO 11. So we'll specify we want this to be called LED. And I'll show you where later in the lab where that becomes important. The next thing we'll do is we want to specify the direction. We're driving an LED, so we want this to be an output. And it's uh, by default set to be a logical one. This is an active high LED that's on the board. And I'm gonna go ahead and set it to be uh, a logical one. So when the board for, and it first configures this pin, it'll set it to be a one, which will turn our LED on. So we can see that as we're stepping through the code. So we've got our pin configured. And the next thing we're gonna do, let me switch back over to the presentation, is we're going to uh, launch the, or switch over to the peripheral tool to set up our pit timer. So here you'll see this is where uh, we, oops, we have, um, let me maximize that again. We have our different perspective buttons and one of them is our peripheral tool. We can switch over to the peripheral tool, a little USB sign, and we'll switch perspectives over and we'll use this plus symbol to specify which uh, driver or which peripheral we'd like to initialize. Um, by default, it, it's uh, there's a little check mark here to only show those that we have drivers in our project already for. And because we already added the pit driver as part of uh, creating our new project, we're good to go. Uh, if we didn't uh, do that, we could uncheck this. We can see all of the peripheral drivers, or sorry, all the peripherals that are available to the peripheral tool. We could select one of those and we'd actually would follow a process through of actually adding in that driver into our project. But, since we've already done that, we can simply select the pit option and hit okay. And now we have a dialog box that's gonna guide us through the process, the different configuration options that we have for this timer. So pretty simple uh, changes that we need to make. We do want it to, to a cause an interrupt because uh, that's how we're actually going to use, uh, use that mechanism to blink and toggle the LED. Uh, by default, it will assign an interrupt handler for us. I don't really care for that name right now, so let's give it something a little bit more uh, applicable to our application. We're gonna call this the LED IRQ. So that is now the function that we need to create uh, that'll allow us to then toggle the pin. Uh, the next thing we do is, is it already has a channel assigned for us. Um, we can add, I think in this one case, it has up to four channels. We're fine with channel zero, but we do want to blink this a little bit faster. So we're gonna say 250 milliseconds and hit enter. That'll use the clock that's already been set up for us. Now you'll notice I didn't use the clock tool because we created this project based on a board, all the clock configurations and things are already done for us. We could modify them if we chose to, uh, but I'm happy with the default settings. And so it actually takes this value of 250 milliseconds. Um, it knows what clock source uh, it's derived from, and so it actually can calculate the number of ticks that it needs to wait until the periodic timer's interrupt fires. So we've, we've, uh, we've muffed our pin, we have uh, configured the pit driver, and so we'll now update the code. If I can get to, apologize, I need to get the, uh, the webinar out of my way. We get this little button here to update the code, I will click that. Uh, it'll review the different changes. So it is going to generate a pin file. It'll regenerate the clock config file. 
and generate the peripheral file. So we hit OK. Uh, by hitting OK here, it will uh, generate all of the code for us and take us back into the development perspective. This is where we have our code editor. And uh, we can do that. So we have created our function. Now the thing that's left for us to do, we'll see if we can do this real quickly before we run out of time for Q&A, is we need to write the actual application uh, to handle this interrupt timer. And that's what's here on this slide. So we're gonna write a function. It's pretty quick. It's you know four or five lines of code. And a lot of the values that you see here are coming from the files, the header files that the, the uh, pen tool and the peripheral tool generated for us. And if we use these uh, variables or these defines, it allows our code to be very portable. I can simply go back into the peripheral tool, make modifications, reassign a pin, change which pit that it's assigned to, which channel it's assigned to and things. And I don't have to modify my code. It, uh, since I use these parameters, it makes it a lot more portable. So we'll do that real quick. Uh, we're gonna write void. And remember the function that we typed in, the function that we typed in before, um, as part of the, the peripheral configuration, that's the function that we're going to write. So the things that we're gonna do is first, we're gonna have a variable to capture um, the flags itself. So we'll create a flag and we will, we need to read the uh, interrupt that occurred. So this is a pit timer. You'll notice one of the things I use a lot is the control space and this will launch the, the uh, context assist to be able to tell me what APIs that I have for the pit timer. Um, and what we're needing to do is we're looking for the one that allows me to get the status of the, the interrupt. So if we go down here, we see get status flags. And you'll notice that it's asking for a base and a channel. And where we get those from, again, inside of these files that the peripheral tool and pen tool created. Let's open up these and I'll just move them over here to the side. These are the files that we are going to use to, to get these parameters. So for the pit timer, that's here in our peripheral.h. We'll paste that in. Um, and then the channel, this is actually comes from the SDK. Okay, pit, and let's use the contact assist. If you grab channel zero. So I've now captured the flag, but I actually then need to clear it. So then we do a call of our pit. And I know it's something like clear something. So I'll use the contact assist. Sure enough, here's our clear status flag. Again, it's asking for base, channel, and now a mask. So base and channel are exactly what we used up here. Cut and paste those in. The mask, the way this works is it's actually the flag. It's the values that it read. Now this is a pretty simple peripheral. There's not a lot of various flags. It's actually just a, a one or a zero. Uh, so otherwise we could go in and make decisions in terms of, of what flags were called and what, how we need to respond. Now, one thing that I will add is I'm gonna read back the status one more time. And what this actually causes the system to do is ensure that the clear status is actually completed. Um, the Invet controller is actually running at a slightly lower clock. Um, so this allows it to ensure that that value has been written. So we don't have to do some other kind of fancy tricks in terms of waiting on assembly or things to get um, our code to, to know that our interrupt happened. So we've, we've appropriately handled the interrupt. Our next step is actually then going to be to toggle our GPIO. So I know this is a GPIO. I'll type in GPIO. That's how all of the, um, the, the various drivers APIs for the SDK work with. They start with the, the name of the peripheral itself. They will align with, if you look inside of here, the driver file, you'll see uh, PIT, you'll see GPIO. Those are the, uh, what the different uh, peripherals will, APIs will start with. And we're wanting to toggle. So let's look through this list here and we see here is our toggle pin. So hopefully they're, they're fairly obvious in terms of what we need to select here. So we're gonna toggle the pin. And now again, we're talking about the pin here. So let's look in our pin file and here's our LED. So we grab our base. Now what's interesting for the mask, this is toggling a port. So our channel, the actual LED that we're toggling is 11. We don't pass in 11 to this, we're passing in a mask. We actually turn multiples of these off and on. We need a one in the 11th position. So we're gonna take and pick a one and we'll shift it over to this position. 
So and that's how those those masks work. Okay, so assuming that I didn't type any uh, any typos or anything in there, I can save that application and then I'll use my uh, quick start panel again to build the application. So we should see down here in the console at building. Should be pretty quick. And while I'm doing that, I am going to plug the board in. So notice I have the RT1010 board. And there are two USB connectors, the one that we need to plug in, and you can see it back in the, the presentation itself. It's the one that's located here, just below the audio and headphone jack. So we'll plug that in. And now we're, we've, we've successfully compiled, and now we're actually going to debug our board. So we can hit the debug button. And I am using this debug button. Uh, one of the unique things about the debug button that's in the QuickTart panel is it actually will go through and launch a probe discovery. So it actually will determine what debug probe I have connected to the device and appropriately set up the debug configuration, which is a really nice feature because oftentimes the debug configuration can be a little bit, a little bit uncertain. And did I set it up right? Uh, this debug button here in the quick start panel will do that for us. All right, so we've got our board is programming. It'll uh, program the board and it's done an initial breakpoint. Um, if we want to, we can use the toolbars up here. This allows us to add some additional breakpoints. We can add one here. Let's add one here just before the booty knit and maybe we put one here in the actual IRQ itself. Um, and then we're using this, this toolbar here. Um, these are the runtime controls, the typical ones that you have in, the, in a, an IDE or a resume. There's a, a break, pause button, and actually terminate, as well as step in, step over, and step out. So we hit the resume. I um, actually see that our little LED, the green LED here, is turned on. That's because we've done the penny knit, right? As part of that penny knit was where we set a Muckstar LED and actually turned it on. Um, and now when I hit go, it's actually going to then start that timer. That was one of the options that we had was to go ahead and start the timer as part of the initialization. So if I hit go now, it should uh, cause the interrupt to fire right away. Sure enough, we see that it did hit a break point here. We're just about at the step to where we'll turn it off. And if we hit resume again, again, we'll hit the interrupt again as the next edge of that periodic timer fires, but now our LED is off. If we were to double click the, period of the uh, break point there and just let it run, we see we have our LED blinking, um, the green one there. Okay, so those are the basic um, options. I think now we'll actually turn it back over to uh, Q&A time, but those are the general concepts that I wanted to cover. Uh, hopefully that provides a good idea of how to develop with the MCU Expresso SDK using the IDE and the configuration tools. Thank you guys very much for your time. Thanks Clark, that was, that was great. All right, so we have some questions from the audience. Um, I think some of these have already been answered in the chat, but I'll read them anyways, so you can give a more in-depth answer. So um, Harry Zhang asked, would the example code from RT 1050 run on RT 1064? Yeah, the, in, in most cases, I would say yes, it, it would. Um, the SDKs that are provided for the RT 1050 and the 1064 are very similar. All the APIs are very consistent between the two boards. So I think in most cases, the example code would run and be, and be portable between the two devices. Now, there are some modifications. They're not code compatible devices, but they are very similar in terms of the SDK APIs. Um, inside of the SDK, there are examples that are included, and you'll see a lot of common examples provided for the 1050, as well as the 1064, as well as the RT1010 that we showed today, where they make sense, right? If the peripherals are available on that device, you'll see very similar examples included. So, so yes, uh, you can't say 100% code compatibility, but very similar SDK APIs. All right. Um, so then Eric Engstrom asked, Concerning the tools that help lower the pain when going from eval board to target hardware, has NXP also put thought and support for keeping the environments in sync with each other to allow development work flowing between the two environments, i.e. original eval board and the target custom hardware? No, I think that that's a, that's a good point because, um, or an interesting concept because it is, it does kind of become two different environments. Um, 
So when porting from uh, an EVK, so a, a board provided by NXP and your own hardware, um, it is kind of recommended to, to create an additional project or right? a, a new project starting targeting the new board and then moving that code over. I think it is an interesting perspective to look at is a way to kind of keep these in sync. And I, I suppose manually, uh, a lot of things could be done with, with setting up shared folders. Um, I think it, it's possible to do manually um, even with the tools that are, is Eclipse based, uh, there are ways to do that. Um, but it, by the uh, kind of the typical, uh, I guess, implementation or the, the, the typical use case is to have kind of two separate projects at least. Okay, yeah, his rest of his question, he says he was thinking of hiring short term third party support or um, protecting hardware IP. So that's his use case. Yeah. Okay. Um, Harry Zhang has a couple more questions. So great questions, Harry. Uh, are there some in-depth training slides or on-demand webinars available on MCU Expresso and its pin config tool? Yeah, so there are, um, so as part of the NXP Tech Day events, um, we've, off, we've taught several classes that cover pin tools, clock tools, and the rest of the MCU Expresso tools. So if you go to the communities um, and search specifically for the NXP Tech Days, you'll find a lot of content that does have slides and training around those. Um, and that is something that we're actively working on is actually creating a number of training videos um, and webinars that do focus more on uh, kind of how-to guides around MCU Expresso. So look for more to come, but do search for the communities. There are some that are there. And NXP Tech Days is what to search for. Yep, NXP Tech Days on the, uh, on the NXP community. Okay, cool. I, um, he also asked, okay, so that was um, answered. Clem Martins asked if you have an Arduino-like IDE available. So there, there's a variety of IDEs that are supported. Um, the one that we showed today was an Eclipse-based IDE um, that we provide. Um, other ones like the IR Embedded Workbench and Kyle and DK are available as well. Um, you do have access to just basic make files. But uh, in terms of a, more of an Arduino-like IDE, uh, I will maybe point out that there um, is the Teensy board. Um, there are Teensy's, even Teensy boards that are based on IWMX RT. It actually does, in fact, enable Arduino directly on um, these boards or on, on the Teensy board itself. So that would be, if you're looking for a true Arduino, I would point you towards a, a Teensy. Uh, Sanyane Arikoya asked, we will like to use evaluation board with kids. How much effort will it require to port it to MicroPython? Yeah, I'm not sure about that. That could be an interesting thing to look at, but I, I wouldn't know how to properly assess um, what it would take to run MicroPython. It'd be something to look to see if we have any partners. We may even have some that have already done some of that work. I'm not aware of it. Cool, yeah, this cost, I mean, it's, it makes sense. Yep. Cool. Um, so Brian Empey asks, what is the lowest end or lowest cost processor supporting SDIO? I have an IoT application and a Wi-Fi Bluetooth module with an SDIO interface I like to use. So um, we have the, the lowest end is RT1020 as an SDIO support on RT family. RT1020. RT1020, okay, thanks, Alan. Okay, um, let's see. So if anybody else has more questions, can you ask them in the QA? I'm gonna look, I think there's a couple more that I didn't see. Um, okay, so yes, from Harry Zhang again. Um, so he says, we use command line tools and Eclipse ID isn't a desired development method. Can we use SDK and MCU configurator tool? Um, Names slips my mind as a standalone tools. Or are they part of the Eclipse IDE? Yeah, so so it is included as a perspective in the IDE, but we do release the configuration tools as a standalone tool, and it's they are specifically designed to then work with other IDEs like IR Kyle as well as a GCC. So you would, you would effectively open up the standalone configuration tools, and as part of the process, you would point. Um, the configuration tools to the location of your GCC project. 
Um, and once it's aware of where your project is located, it'll go in and it'll find, identify the pen files, clock files, and peripheral files, um, and then allow you to, to modify those, update those directly in the configuration tools. And just like the, the button where you saw me hit the update project, um, instead of that switching back over to the IDE, it would actually do the same thing. It would generate the code and write it to the file system. And then I would switch back over to whatever editor I'm using um, and you would see those files reflected, the, the modifications that generated the code reflected there. Great. So Clem Art Martins asked again, can you handle WAVE files and what support do I need? So I do know that I've seen, there is audio particularly on this board um, and I have run through other, not on this board itself, but using the SDK itself, I have run through some examples of, of effectively reading a WAV file um, and, and processing, driving it out through the I2S interface. Um, in that case, in the example that I'm referring to, I actually had a little um, amplifier, a little I2S amplifier. And I, but I believe on the RT1010, there actually is an audio codec um, I'm assuming it's hooked up to the I2S interface as well. So you should be able to, to, to parse a, a, a WAV file and effectively just pump it out through that I2S interface to the audio, the onboard audio codec. And is there SD card support? Um, is there, SD, I know in the SDK there is. Um, I'm looking at this board here. I don't see an actual SD card on the EVK, Alan. Perhaps can you comment, is, uh, is there a SD card or SDIO on the 1010 or is that only on the larger devices? 1020, start from 1020. 1020, okay, yeah. so, so starting with the 1020, you'd have access for an, an SD card. Um, and there are other LPC and Kinetis devices that also have um, SDIO. Um, and then if there is support for the hardware, then you'll find SDK examples for mounting a file system to the SD card or reading and writing memory to it. All right. Harry J has a quick question. Do you recommend to buy them for regular projects or mostly Final Fantasy you express so long for debugging? And what are we, them, um, I'm not sure in context what them is referring to. Oh, he meant other commercial debuggers, Sager, Kiel, et cetera. Oh, sure, yeah. Um, you know what, it, it's really kind of a, a personal preference. Um, there's a lot of advantages of using some of the commercial debuggers in terms of the additional tools, uh, the speed of debugging, um, and other production capabilities. Uh, so so I'm, I'm not going to not recommend them. They're, they're great, great tools. Um, but for, you know, quick development on one of our EVKs, um, we do have debug circuitry built onto it. But certainly as you're going to your hardware, um, you'll need some way to debug those. And so likely in those cases, you would use uh, some type of a commercial debug. Anonymous question, uh, for which market was this chip developed? It has corresponding certificates to use in an automotive branch. Or if it, ha I guess the question is, if it has corresponding certificates. Okay, so um, this uh, chip RT1010 uh, is uh, developed for the consumer and industry. So we don't have this part for the automotive uh, uh, applications. Uh, on the, in the RT family, we have the RT1170, which has the automotive uh, qualification. You can support the automotive uh, applications, but all the other RT um, we don't have a plan to enable those RT part for automotive. All right. But RT1170 is the one we have for auto automotive. Okay. Um, then Brian Empey asks, does Zephyr OS option have same level of driver support as free RTOS option, specifically There's USB host ethernet on RT1020, et cetera? Yeah, so certainly the um, free Zephyr OS is going to have um, all of the same uh, low level drivers, so all the peripherals you need to exercise the different peripherals. Um, and then the Zephyr platform itself does have a variety of other higher level, so the things like the USB and Ethernet. Uh, so you'd have to look into those communities themselves to see what options are available for those higher level um, middleware components. But in terms of the base enablement, that's that's what we kind of contribute and provide into the Zephyr OS. 
and then let the the community or the 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 program there derive and, and provide support for those higher level functions. So you'd have to just check with the Zephyr community to see what's what options they have. Yeah, it's a two part question. So part two is, does RT1010 support external NAND flash? Um, the answer is uh, yes and no. So RT1010 has a flex SPI, which can support the external uh, SPI NAND flash, but RT1010 doesn't support the raw NAND flash, which is parallel. Got it. Okay, so it's 11.02, so we should probably wrap it up now, but those were some great questions. Um, <laughs> do you guys have time for one more question? Oh, Harry Zhang. Okay, so Harry Zhang asks, is free RTOS the most recommended RTOS for this MCU, or is there anything else optional? I, I would say it probably would be the most recommended just because it is the one that comes uh, kind of pre-integrated with the SDK. So it certainly is going to be the, the easiest to use. Um, I did mention that there are, uh, you do have full access to the source code. Um, you can integrate other RTOSs, and we're even talking with uh, other RTOS providers uh, for just basic enablement with NCU Expresso, but it certainly is the one that out of the box is going to work the cleanest right now. Great. Okay. So we will be sharing the recording with everyone who attended after this. Um, so you'll see, you, you can rewatch it as much as you like. Um, thank you so much, Clark and Alan, for dropping your knowledge on us. That was great. Yeah, thank you. Absolutely. Thank you, Monica. Yes. And Kathleen reminded you, if you can download slides, um, she posted the link there. So make sure you do that. And have a great day, everyone, or, or night, <laughs> wherever you are. Bye. Thank you. Bye. Thank you. Bye. Bye.